We heard about one of the instances where the Hebrews were given these new commandments. The context for this, of course, is the Hebrews have been delivered from Egypt after being enslaved for generations. They didn't know who they were. They had lost any context or, or, uh, and really had lost the traditions of their own religion and, and had to be reminded and had to be told through Moses and through Moses being told by God. And they wandered out into the wilderness not knowing where they were going and they were lost and they were complaining and many of them wanted to go back. Said slavery would be better than this. And so they are given these commandments, which are much more than commandments, but uh, reminding them who their God is. Because many of them wanted to go back to the gods and the idols of the Egyptians and the ones that they worshipped in Egypt. And they were reminded that their God was Yahweh. Their God was the one who rescued them, who saved them, and brought them out from slavery. And to, to focus and be centered on this God. And then they were given uh, commandments on how to go forward and treat one another. I wonder what kind of values and morals had developed from the Egyptians and from their time in Egypt and their time as slavery. Uh, and what, uh, what their view of some of these laws were. And over the years, of course, the laws grew and we had to, uh, the, they had to kind of flesh them out. And so the Levitical laws, the laws we find in Exodus and Deuteronomy, all stem from these Ten Commandments of growing and growing. And then, of course, there's the Midrash that grows and grows to the understanding of the law and how to follow it, how to be God's people. Until we get to Jesus' time, where it's very well established where not only is there law, but there is a large temple housing the Ark of the Covenant, which is said to have housed the Ten Commandments inside this vessel. And it was a holy place. And only the most clean and holiest of priests could come in anywhere close to the Ark of the Covenant. And there were all sorts of rules and laws about who, how to worship God, how to come to the temple, how to sacrifice, what to sacrifice, what you were sacrificing for, and how to live. And as we know, as Jesus walked, he was challenged. What do you say about adultery? What do you say about murder? What do you say about these, the Sabbath? And he's challenged, and he's always giving the most unconventional answer, one that stumps the people who are trying to stump him or angers them. And then he comes into the temple, and that's where we pick up in John chapter 2, verses 12 through 22. The temple had an elaborate system of sacrifice, of being able to sacrifice, and you had to buy the sacrifice from the temple, and so it was also, you know, it helped support the building of the temple. And here is where we enter into the story. Starting at verse 12. After he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body, and he was raised from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had, had, had spoken. May this living word instruct our hearts in the way of faith. Amen. Well, I know rules are important. I'm a parent, and we're always making up new ones every day, it seems. <laughs> 
If you read in the paper, you know that they're planning on building a traffic circle, a roundabout, I should say, out on 53rd, and there's much to be said about that by different people. I lived in New Jersey in the seminary, and I grew to appreciate the, the roundabouts. I was terrified, Adam, of them first, because there's no stoplights. You just have to enter. And, and I was terrified of them. But as I learned the rules and the way to yield, and as I noticed that everyone else who knew the rules did it right, and if you did it right, I grew to love them because I didn't have to stop. <laughs> In New Jersey, no one likes to stop. <laughs> but it was much more efficient when people knew how and were confident on how to drive them and uh, knew the rules. They were much more efficient, although I understand the apprehension people have for them because if they don't know the rules then they can muck everything up and it can be a mess and there can be even accidents Um, if you hesitate and uh, wait it can be a mess but rules once you know the rules and so I hope that what Corvallis institutes this they do a very good job at instructing people about the rules of driving because you can't just put these things up and not expect and not and expect people to know all the different rules for driving them Rules are important. They help us. They guide us. They give us structure. They help society run. But there can be time when we are lost, when we don't know the rules, when we don't know where we are and we need some guidance. I was a Boy Scout and uh, we went to the same Boy Scout camp, backpacking camp every summer. And as I grew up in that camp, I learned all the trails and the the hikes that we took in. And soon I became part of the leadership. And one summer I had was given the charge of leading in a bunch of young new scouts, first year, 10 year, 11 year old kids and and lead them. And I was, you know, the old mature 16. Um, (laughs) We had to lead them in uh, to to our base camp. And there were different ways you could go. You could go on the main logging road most of the way, but that was long, and it wasn't the most direct route. And then there were several different shortcuts. And I was pretty confident in the shortcuts because I had taken them over the years. But as we got uh, into the journey, I realized at some point I had maybe taken the wrong uh, fork. And I had all these kids and these 10-year-olds complaining, carrying packs for the very first time. When are we going to get there? You're lost. You don't know where we're going. And me having to say, no, I know where we're going. And I was just terrified that I was just taking them in the wrong direction. And I had to kind of tune in into my memory of that space and that place and the sky. And all I could see were trees. And finally, we got up to a rise, and I was able to see off to the distance uh, these things called the Dardanelles in the Sierra Nevadas. One looked like a dog, one looked like an elephant. Rock uh, outcroppings uh, in the range there. And I said, ah, there are the Dardanelles. The lake is right below it. And was able to get us back on track. I found my landmark. And we were able to get there. And I was never, never had to tell them, we're lost. <laughs> But landmarks are important. Landmarks kind of give us a, an idea of where we are and help us move forward. And I do believe that God gives us these landmarks in our lives to help guide us and show us who we are, where we are, and which way to go. But as I said, even from these landmarks, even from these laws that Moses was given to give to the Hebrew people, we don't tend to always agree about then how those are supposed to be governed in our lives. He says God is God, but who is God? Well, God is the one who saved them. Well, that's the beginning. God is the one who cares for them, who saves them, who liberates. So God is a liberating God. But then uh, the, how, to do, how to worship God? What are idols? What isn't an idol? What is an idol? In that time, it was pretty uh, clear because physical idols were made and worshipped in that time. In our time, we have to kind of discern, well, what are we making an idol of in our lives? And so they expand the law. They write so much on the law and what uh, the law is and isn't. And that's why we have so much written, not only in our scriptures, but in the Midrash, which is an exegetical understanding and conversation and stories from the Jewish people about the scriptures. Thousands of pages just trying to show us what, how do we do, how do we follow these landmarks 
What is the Sabbath? What is work on the Sabbath? How do we follow and keep the Sabbath? How do we honor our parents? How do we, um, what is a wrongful use of God's name? Uh, in this version, I actually disagree with the NRSV translation when it says you shall not murder because the Hebrew word is very clearly kill. It is kill. And that's a hard one that we have struggled with since it was given. Because we wonder, does that mean we never kill even in defense or, or in protecting and as we face a, a violent world where people do kill? What is right? Is killing ever right? And that is one that the church has been divided on and argues about. Is there just war or is killing outright just always a commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Ten commandments don't tell us. It just says thou shalt not. And so much has been written and much has been said about that. As we know, Jesus was challenged on things like adultery and divorce and stealing and, and coveting as well. How do we live these things out? And of course, we are given laws, but not the consequences. What happens if you don't follow the laws? How do we make it right? And of course, there's a lot written about that and the justice and our very own laws and our courts rise from the Judaic understanding of law and consequence and justice and making things right. All of this to try to help the Hebrews find their way to be God's people. It's easy to get disoriented as we get into the minutia of law. That's why lawyers are so popular. <laughs> because they have to deal with that minutia of law and they can understand it and help us navigate it. But it also can be why lawyers get so many jokes because it gets so burdensome sometimes. It's so much about the law. It's easy to be disoriented to lose our landmarks and our sights of which is the actual way to walk, which is the way to be God's people, to be bombarded by messages and to have our landmarks eroded away until we cannot see them anymore. What are our landmarks? And we can become lost not just by the overwhelming sense of ideas of well, what's right and what's wrong and, and the consequences of, of, uh, of laws that, that can be both positive and negative on various people. But we also can lose our landmarks when we ourselves are flung out when we lose something. The Hebrews lost their home. Yes, they were slaves, but they lost all that they were familiar with. They had lost and they had nothing, only what they could grab and take on their way out. And we too can become lost and lose our landmarks. We can lose someone we've shared our life with, most of our lives with, and be lost in grief and not know how to go forward. We can lose a job and be lost in, in a sense of what our career and our purpose is. We, we can lose our health or our abilities. We can begin losing our memory and fear being lost, and ca captive to our own bodies and health. Depression can sink us into a murk where we don't know which way to go or, or how to get out of it. And we're not sure where we're going or really who we are. And it's into this world, the world that Jesus comes. A world where we're trying to make it clear and there's two ways to go. And, and it's either to make it really clear with lots of rules and lots of laws and re really strict punishments or really clear punishments. And if you don't follow them, then you're outcast. And if you follow them, then you're in. And we can do that. So Jesus comes into that world. And there are well-defined landmarks, the temple built around the laws, representative of God being situated in one place and ruling through one way of understanding, building around it. And Jesus comes into that and, and, and challenges, and challenges people's understanding of law and says there's a different way. You've lost sight. This temple, this landmark you've built, well, maybe good intention, has caused us to, and you to lose sight of the landmarks that God has given you. 
Jesus cutting through all of that, saying, I will tear down this temple. Boy, that is something that would get him in trouble. I think, and most scholars think, that this upsetting the economy of the temple and threatening to tear it down really sealed his fate. He was threatening a very way of life for so many. He was threatening what that had been built up for so long by so many. And that sealed his fate as an enemy that they sought to crucify. The temple, tear it down. All of these laws, tear them down and rebuild. Time to rebuild. Be baptized. Die and rebuild to something new. We as Reformed uh, Church, uh, in the Reformed tradition, are Reformed and always reforming. The very statement of that implies that we're ever changing, ever asking, what is God doing now? How is God reforming us? The very word reforming is just a continual cycle of being dying and raising up, of letting go and being built up. And so we look for our landmarks in this world where we can be so confused, where the church is losing ground, where 30% of the people in Oregon say they're unaffiliated to any religion whatsoever. We can grasp toward what we used to know, what used to work, our idols, or we can grasp, as some churches do, to law and legal and make it very clear and cut and dry, and many people like that and become more fundamental. Or is there another way? Is there a landmark bigger than these laws that God gives us? Jesus says that he will rebuild the temple in three days, and he is talking of his resurrection, of his bringing to us that God doesn't desire to live in rules and laws and in temples. God desires to be a living God that that lives in us, temples. That we're not just given landmarks, but we are given a guide who would live and walk with us. Because landmarks without a guide will just continue to make us lost. But the guide is given to us. The Spirit is given to us to help us know how to walk, to help us remember the principal things that Jesus reminded people of, to love God with all of who you are, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the sum of the Ten Commandments, and that's the sum of all law that Jesus would have us follow. But we can't do that without our guide to allow and to listen and to hear the God who would dwell with us, to take time to find the landmark within, the presence with us and for us, the Spirit of God. So wherever you are in your journey, whether you're wandering, whether you're lost, whether you're certain, let us turn and allow God Allow the presence of Christ and allow the Spirit to be our guide, our landmark, our rock. Amen.